and welcome to this week's show. And uh, what are we doing this week? Well, we are going to kind of wrap up the whole awards thing that we've been talking about over the last uh, week or so. Uh, in particular, the Screen Actors Guild uh, Awards, which of course happened a little while ago, and we featured that here. Uh, we found a little round table thing that the Screen Actors Guild had put together, uh, which features all of the nominated stunt performers, uh, I say all, a majority of them to be fair, um, as far as film and television is concerned. Uh, it's a Q&A and uh, the uh, coordinators include Lee Morrison, uh, of course representing No Time to Die, uh, Monique Gangerton, uh, who uh, represents Loki, Scott Rogers uh, for The Matrix Resurrections, Tom Struthers for Dune, uh, Justin Reimer for Mayor of East Town, and Ken Barefield, who is representing Cobra Kai. They were all coordinators on those pictures and TV shows. It is moderated by Janisha adams Ginyard, who is herself a stunt uh, performer and a SAG-AFRA member. And uh, it's, it's an entertaining watch. Uh, watch it, uh, enjoy it, uh, find out a little bit more about the performer's and uh, their coordinating and their rules of how to get the job done and how they get the job done. And we'll see you on the other side. Welcome to the SAC After Foundation's The Business Program. I'm Janisha Adams Ginyard, Emmy nominated actress and stuntwoman, a member of the SAC After National Stunt Committee. I would like to introduce to you our SAG Awards nominated stunt coordinators. We have Ken Bearfield from Cobra Kai, Monique Ganderton from Loki, Justin Raymer from Mayor of Easttown, Lee Morrison from No Time to Die, Tom Struthers from Dune, and Scott Rogers from Matrix Resurrections. Hey, thanks. Thanks for being here, everybody. I'm so excited to talk to you all. This is going to be one hell of a ride that's going to be very entertaining. So just follow along. Mm. Um, before we get into some really fun questions, I want to start off with the first one that everyone wants to know is where were you when you found out that your project was nominated for an award? <laughs> I'll start with who wants to go first? Uh, Tom, <laughs> Tom, you go first. <laughs> yeah, Tom, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> when we're last on, no, I have mine kind of cool. Um, I can go first if you guys want. Um, I, I've been, I haven't really been working, so I haven't been on social media. I haven't been checking my emails. I haven't been doing any of that stuff. I've been on my ranch, just riding horses. And I got a text message from Tom Hiddleston saying, hey, congratulations on your SAG award or SAG nomination. <laughs> so, and he said, you know, how proud he was of the team and how, how grateful he was of everybody. So I thought that was kind of cool. I was like, oh, oh, that's a great way to find out. Yeah, totally. Lead actor calls and tells you. <laughs> a, tech, a, a very nice text message, yes. Yes. <laughs> so that was really sweet. Totally. <laughs> Justin, you want to go next? I, I, uh, sure. I, I uh, think so. I don't know if I have that good of a story, but um, I was in I was in my I was in my garage working out, and uh, I had uh, I had kind of split the show with another uh, coordinator from New York, Chris Chris Place, and uh, he had uh, sent me a text message, and that's kind of how I found out. I think uh, I honestly don't re I oddly did get a text message, but I don't remember who it was from or where I was. <laughs> <laughs> and then, it, and then I got a couple more, but uh, not from anybody high profile. <laughs> fairly boring story. Yeah, yeah. I'll jump in there as well, Scott. I got one from Olivier Schneider, who I'm also representing. It was all in French, and after working with for two or three years, I'm still crap at French. Anyway, sorry, I'm not very good at French, I should say. So uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I was I was just I was on a plane headed to uh, Honolulu, and then when I got off the flight and turned my phone on, it was like 
I didn't know what was going on. I was Ralph Fazio, <laughs> Billy Zabka, it was all the writers and yeah. my whole fun team. And I'm like, what in the world happened? So obviously I opened Ralph's first and he's like, congrats on the nomination. I'm like, nomination? I I go look, look. <laughs> all right. So that was the way I found out that way. Nice. So you, you were in airplane mode and then once you turned it on, <laughs> it was like, <laughs> I landed, it just exploded. And I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah. Um, I literally woke up to an email from uh, Dennis Villeneuve just saying congratulations. And I was in Europe at the time. I'm back there now. But he just, yeah, he sent me a congratulations and for getting nominated, was, which was lovely. Awesome. Great. So now I would like to know, um, how did you guys get your start as stunt coordinators? Uh, let's go with you first, Tom. Um, I, 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 I suppose I owe most of it to Simon Crane and Paul Jennings, really. That's what my, I came, I came up with those, uh, with Simon Crane and then went on to work for Paul and that gave me the opportunity to go on and, and coordinate. So that's kind of, uh, what was really good. Uh, I had a similar story with Dan Bradley and, you know, we were doing smaller movies and they kept growing and, you know, in his career moved into second units of my career, filled in the void behind his. And, and then, when, you know, I think Spider-Man 2 kind of was the big turning point for me and kind of took off from there. Mo, Ken. <laughs> <laughs> I had a lot of good, you know, great mentors coming up because I'm, you know, I'm the, the newbie to this group. It's, you know, highly intimidating sitting here right now looking at Mo and Scott and Lee and Tom and Justin, all these guys who I've known about for years. And, you know, this is a lot of their first time seeing my face, but, you know, I owe it all to a lot of good mentors like Jonathan Arthur, Eddie Yancic, Tier Turner, all these guys who kind of took me under their wing and let me follow them up. And then, you know, having the, the creators of the show, John, Josh and Hayden, you know, taking a shot on me. So that's, how I got to where I'm at. I'm very lucky. I'll also say that. Yeah. I we're, all, we're all lucky. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes. I, oh. I'm going to come back to you, uh, Mo, for a question. You mentioned something, Ken, about being mentored by some of the coordinators that you were working with. Um, and maybe, Mo, you can start off with this, the answer to this question. How do you find or make that um, area for advancement you know is it always becoming a stunt performer and then going to stunt coordinator like how do you mentor I guess the next generation to create that environment for advancement how did how did it happen with me or how am I doing it moving forward um, <laughs> either either either, either you one. know I I would honestly like I was lucky enough to be <clears throat> to be um like I was in a, like, I'm, okay, I'm a woman, obviously. Um, it's been super difficult to, to advance from like <laughs> being a performer to being a, an assistant stunt coordinator as I, when I was performing. And so honestly, I was lucky enough to just have been working with Sam and working Sam Hargrave and working with Dave Leach. And I kept learning how to be an assistant, but was not able to get that credit because of studio and, and whatnot. So that happened on multiple movies. And then Atomic Blonde happened and Dave was like, oh, I really want you to come double. And I was like, um, I would like to be an assistant stunt coordinator on this movie. <laughs> and I was so nervous because I was like, oh, God, I can't like, you know, what if they say no or whatever? And he's like, oh, yeah, that's not a big deal. OK, cool. Can you like hurry up and get here? And I'm like, oh, yes, I can. You know, and that was my first credit sort of as like fight team and, and assistant coordinator. And then it just kept, then it was much easier to, to hire me. So what I'm trying to do as a stunt coordinator is bring in people who are deserving of the credit or doing the work and, you know, bringing them up as like maybe a, a fight, a fight choreographer or, a, you know, something like that as like Sarah Irwin, I had um, be the fight coordinator on a couple episodes of She-Hulk recently. Yeah. And, and it's just sort of building up those credits and, and giving them a voice and, um, yeah, and and trying to keep moving forward. And now I'm seeing so many, so many stunt coordinators, or stunt coordinators are bringing females up for assisting and fight yeah. choreography. And it's just, yeah, I think they see the value of having both perspectives when you're creating something. So 
it's going in a good direction. And I like it. It's, I'm, yeah. I'm proud of everybody. Mm-hmm. Totally. I, I, if I, if I, may, I think I, for me personally, I'm always looking for the next, you know, cause I like seeing guys advance. I like mm-hmm. seeing guys moving up and moving on and, you know, guys that I came in through with, you know, whether it's Darren Prescott or Chris O'Hara, a lot of really big names now. Um, but everybody like Chris O'Hara, when we were doing Spider-Man two or three, we had a whole slew of stunt guys, but he was just different. He paid yeah. attention differently. He and you and you guys can speak to this, that you you always see there's always somebody that's a little different because not I don't think everybody's cut out to be a coordinator, but mm-hmm. there's certain guys and if you get a you know, 20, 30 stunt guys, there's two or three that are you just notice something. They pay attention a little different. They're a little more conscientious. They're not just sitting around telling stories. And those are the guys I tour, start to lean on. And then I'll give them a, like a, a job or a little small thing. And then if they do well with that, and who does well in small things generally yeah. does well in big things. And I just keep moving them for that. And I've you know, been really fortunate to you know, have some really first rate people. And I love seeing them grow and move on. And, you know, like Chris O'Hara, we were doing Zohan and he did a smash up job. And then Sandler was producing uh, Mall Cop. And I just went, hey, you should have Chris O'Hara do that. And he was like, OK, great. And then that was Chris's first coordinating gig. And it was a great opportunity for him. But he had earned it because he just smashed out, you know, when we did Zohan. So that's how I do it. Well, just, I'll I'll story. <laughs> let me tell you a story about Mr. Lee Morrison there. His first day on set, and a few of you guys would like this, Justin Scott. On his <laughs> first day on set, he turns up ramp to ramp on a brand new Husqvarna. Okay, pair of shorts and a T-shirt. He jumps a bike, ends up midway, upside down, and rides off a brand new bike on his first day on set. That was Mr. Morrison. He got back up and did it again. It was quite interesting. Thank you for that, Tom. I suppose I'd better jump into this, really, and go yeah, what exactly. Scott said as well. Uh, Justin knows me, a few guys know yeah. me, and Tom was there that day, my first day on set working for Simon Crane, who brought me into the industry when I was 23. An amazing team, Tom was in that. Wade, lots of uh, Steve Griffin, Dave Cronley, Eunice, an amazing team. Imagine being brought in as your first team of 23 by Mr. Simon Crane and then progressing to work with all of the, in, in, again, you know, the Darren Prescott's, the Darren Bradley's, the Tom Struthers, Paul Jennings, Vic Armstrong, Gary Powell, you know, all of these guys that I grew up working with. And I genuinely, and when, when Scott was talking about spotting people, I genuinely loved watching everybody do every single thing. Even though I'd go and run mats for people, even if it meant, you know, picking up the, the rigging kit at the end of the day or, or testing something in a harness, I generally fell in love with the stunt industry and I had no interest in going into it. But I fell in love with it completely coming from a motorcycle background and learned all the disciplines. But also going through to see other um, stunt falls, including Dave Leach and, and working worldwide with lots of, you know, oh. great... Great friends in America, great friends in France, you know, where we work in Germany, everywhere. You just still see the same attitude all the way through. And, I, and for me, it was just watching some amazingly talented people do it. Somehow ended up being promoted to an assistant coordinator to run big setups. Uh, I never really knew how I got there, but I used to love doing it and enjoying it. And Gary Power, really. I spent 10 years as his right hand and, and working for, you know, Vic Armstrong and Paul Jennings and Tom and, you know, all of these guys. So it's, uh, and I'm trying to do the same thing. You know, like Scott said, you see guys that pay attention. They're not on their phones. They're willing to build a box rig. They're looking at how Scott would set it up, how Tom would set it up, Monique, all of you guys, Justin. It's just a joy to watch the new new breed coming through that aren't just interested in Instagram, that actually genuinely want to actually get involved in the industry and be a, a coordinator for the right reasons. Love it. Yeah. So they're not interested in the followers, but they're interested in like following the leader. It's learning that I got taught a trade. I got taught a trade by lots of the guys actually who are even on, on this call. And it's a, it's an amazing job, isn't it? You know, and I think that going through the last year has really, for me, definitely, I was so sport, traveling the world, huge projects, doing all these amazing projects and meeting so many cool people. And yeah, I maybe still took it for granted a little, but not now. You know, even when we were shooting on Bond, I made sure that I never, I try not to get stressed. Me and Tom talk often. 
enjoy it what how often do you get to go to an, an ancient city or get to jump off a bridge or what you know scott up in scotland you know monique working in germany or justin wherever justin yeah. is at the moment tom in hungary it's an amazing amazing that we, we how we get to travel and work and play really and i think just <clears throat> backing up what scott and Leon are saying i think that you see people who for one reason or another they stick out i mean i started my career i was I was very happy flying airplanes and riding horses in the middle of middle of East Africa. And oh. Simon Crane seen me and said, would you like a job? And, you know, I'd already had some background training and other things. I, I wasn't going to ever be in the film business. That was about as far left field as you could ever imagine for me. <laughs> and um, next thing you know, I'm in Turkey for a couple of months. And then my first big project and lucky with when I started, there was like an apprenticeship, you know, the money was different, you, you know, it was really humbling in a lot of respects because you have to go through that and we're on a job for six or eight months at a time when nowadays with budgets and things like that, it's very difficult for stunt coordinators and second year mm. directors to give people that chance that I had with Simon Crane for the 10 years. And I mean, my first big project was Braveheart. So I was on that for eight months and then I went to Titanic for nine months and things like that. And we were there for the whole time, you know, and, you know, Simon, you'd see people coming in and out earning, you know, a full stunt wage and everything like that. And when I was learning, I was like the kid from Africa. And I'm like, wow, shit, man. Well, I could do a lot with that in Africa, you know. But <laughs> I, I realized after about two years that I've got an apprenticeship. And what Lee just said, it is given a career and a family and a home, all from that one person who said, I like the way he rode a horse. And that's literally where it yeah. came from. And I think we've all been through that at some point. Um, everyone has been very lucky to have someone, I think, that took notice of them. And I think, you know, and I honestly, uh, like Monique, for example, you know, she's probably had to work harder than four of us all put together because coming through the business when she came through, it was not accepted to have female coordinators and, and assistant coordinators and in charge of, of the sets and that, you know, and it, it wasn't. What that wasn't accepted, it just wasn't recognized, I suppose, you know. And we've had some really great performers and people who are great coordinators, um, females over the years, and they just never really had, you know, that one jump. And Dave Leach gave it to Monique, you know. And so you've got to give respect to those people. They came through the system. I remember when Dave Leach was just doing backflips on Troy, you know, mm -hmm. that was his whole thing. He could do backflips all day long. <laughs> Literally, he was an incredible gym. I can't imagine him doing that now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well. I couldn't imagine me doing any of those sort of things. Oh I'm a little God. old and fat for that now, but yeah. I, Tom, I appreciate you saying that. That's that's like really, really cool to say. And also Tom ratcheted me off a horse one time, and that was kind of cool too. So I appreciate <laughs> you. <laughs> you did do that, yeah. But. Um, so this next question um, was sent in by Angel Manuel, who's a stuntman. And this is for Justin mm -hmm. and Ken. Uh, what stunt sequence are you most proud of in the nominated project? So that would be your Cobra Kai and your Mayor of Easttown. Uh, you know, I guess, you know, I, you know, obviously Mayor of Easttown is a way different show than everyone else's show that is uh, nominated here. It's so um, good. It's so good. Oh my God. It's a great show uh, for sure. And, you know, I think, you know, I, like I said, I came into the show towards the end, but um, we did a little chase through a house and ended up shooting the bad guy and doing all that stuff, which in itself is not a crazy action sequence, right? But you have to develop it the right way to make sure the story works. Um, you know, I think that was that was a good, a excellent sequence, a fun sequence for me, just because of, and I'll lay out, it's because of Kate Winslet, you know, just to kind of, I think I walked in and the next day we were shooting it or whatever we were doing. Um, so I think that's to just walk into something with, you know, uh, an extremely experienced actress who knows what she wants and knows what she's doing and definitely has her own opinions on how things should go and to kind of just mold that and, and make that work was good, for, you know, good for me. Uh, I, that was one of the better sequences I liked. I loved it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have to say my favorite sequence would be, I would say episode nine and 10, which is the all Valley tournament. 
just because of what a beast it was. It was, you know, the main mat that we had, and then we had four different mats on the outside, so five mats all together. So while we're fighting on the middle mat, there's, you know, you're seeing the entire world. So I think we had two and a half weeks to shoot episode nine and 10 Mm -hmm. with the whole all Valley tournament with the opening sequence. And then the finale fights, the semi fights, I think it, we totaled it out to be about uh, 80 fights. We had to choreograph in the span of two weeks, given all the background fights, this, that, and the other. And so it wouldn't have been possible without having to have such a good fight team that I had with me. Don Lee is my fight coordinator. And then, you know, I had my core team, Craig Henningsen, Jesse House, Selkie Hom, Olivia Brown. And we were just nonstop, you know, 12 hours, 15 hours a day. We set up like little catering tents to run through all the rehearsals and everything. And all the actors, they'd film their scene, they'd come out there. We would do, you know, rehearsals night and day. And it was just you know, it was an accumulation of everything that we've been working on from the start of the season, three and a half, four months into it Mm -hmm. with the weapons work, with everything that was kind of involved with it. And then it was kind of like, okay, here it is. Now let's showcase all of it. So given all the parameters of that, it would definitely have to be the, you know, episode nine and 10. all Yeah. And keeping, and keeping the life, you know, from the 84 tournament of the original Karate Kid, kind of keeping that vibe, but making it that much bigger, given it's season four. Uh, I'm glad you said that about the original. Um, There's a question for you, Scott, that was specifically kind of talking about what Ken just mentioned. Um, This comes from actor stuntman Austin J. And he says, did you approach Matrix Resurrections in a way where you were trying to avoid duplicating the original action? Or did you come in with the mindset of mirroring the first installment? Um, it really came out of Lana. Or, you know, she, her vision in a broad strokes was the uh, first Matrix was taking what's not real and make it feel real and give it a, a kind of a real feel. Um, but knowing it wasn't real and kind of altering reality. And now this one, she wanted to flip that and take what's and make everything feel real. So a lot of, lot, her idea was a lot more blue screen, a lot of, you know, the effects in the first installments. And this one was getting away from that as much as possible so that it felt more um, authentic, more real, more down to earth. And that's, you know, lighting's a big deal to her, almost more than, um, and, you know, you, if you look at it, the choreo, everything's a little different. Um, it just feels a little different. And, um, that was that was more just her, what she was looking for. I'm always hearing, you know, directors, coordinators are saying they want it to be more authentic. They want it to look real. Um, and then I think CGI. Um, and I'm like, okay, they've been using that a lot. So Danny Arroyo, who's an actor, writer, and producer, and this question is for everyone. He says, with modern day action films embracing more use of CGI, has there been less need for practical stunts or stunt people in general for the films and TV? Or do you find it more of a need because when actual stunts are needed, they become more dangerous? Um, This is for everyone, uh, but who would like to start? Lee? Okay. (laughs) huge movies you tell us yeah yeah, yeah thanks scott yeah <laughs> talk. right okay so i suppose from coming out of the back of um no time to die and that's my fifth bond for me and olivier in, inheriting you know the reins of that from gary and then obviously working under barbara and michael and with daniel so again for all of us we're now working with cg and vfx departments incredible you know and especially with volumes as well and 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 working especially car chases now we can shoot arrays we can get you know the backgrounds light interactive lighting make it working amazing for the dps and for directors but ultimately i think all of us still try to achieve something practically um so i'm, I'm pretty sure i know a few of you we all start how can we achieve it practically you know whether it's just wire removal whether it's just extending cg extending a set so it, I think we've all embraced it. We've had to, um, and it, and it's it's really just for me and Olivier. It was approaching every location and doing everything practically on bond. 
uh, as you know, following you know the footsteps of all the coordinators that have coordinated a bond. That was really important. So everything you see a human do or doing, no time slow. We had to at least try to do it practically. Everything a vehicle did had to be done practically. You know, the fights again, which, you know, had to do and make sure they were all clean hits, not extend any arms or legs, excuse me, or uh, rely heavily on CG. But you have to embrace it. We all do. And it just enhances everything. It's, it's there to really just to, to enhance and, um, and basically do credit to what we're doing practically, I think, if we do it right. That's, that's what we try to do. Yeah, I agree completely. If you use it as, yeah, like a tool, it's just another tool in your toolbox. Absolutely. and. And you could do a, a massive sequence practically, but then have that one CG car that sort of, you know, comes in or you have, you know, some, you know, your padded table and then you, you know, do an element of that or whatever, whatever it is that can just enhance your, your natural um, environment. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. And it doesn't take your eye away from it. Obviously something like Avengers or something that's a very CG mm. world, but it's, it's amazing using, you know, visual effects on a practical grounded movie because it doesn't yeah. take it doesn't take away it just enhances it it's and added value. it's really it's added. fun oh, yeah it's super fun to sort of go through and design and be like oh well let's do a stitch here and we'll use the actor and we'll just you know this will be a cg car but everything else is real you know it's just yeah it's really it's really fun and a different way of sort of creating a sequence so i, yeah. I love my vfx friends and i just <laughs> Like they're the amazing. I, <laughs> I agree with Monique and you know Tom and Lee. I mean we're all a little bit older, and you know I think it's a great tool. And I just don't have the stomach to see people get hurt. You know, yeah. and it gives us an opportunity to still do big, huge stuff. But it's like you put a pad down and you're like, and just paint it out. You know, yeah. I I won't ask people to do things that we would have done without question back in the day. You know, and it's just like, there's no point in it. And, you know, we, we want to, you know, and it's sort of this dichotomy. It's like, how do we push the edge and the limit, but how do we get everybody to go home safely? You know, it's just, yeah. there's no world in my world anymore that we want people just like, oh, well, that's, you know, that's part of doing stunts. Well, it's not yeah. anymore. It just doesn't <laughs> that's a good point, Scott. Yeah. And yeah. I think I got to agree with Scott and, and Lee and Monique on this, that, We've got to push the boundaries. That's what we do, and that's why we, we like what we do. And I think coming from having Nolan as a mentor, we try to do everything in camera. But I would say, you know, like there's, there's one thing I've done, sequence that I've done that I'd, I'd go back and do visual effects now, and that was the four guys out the back of the C-130 on Dark Knight <laughs> Rises. We did everything practically. And I had one guy landed his parachute wrong and, and got bent, but when I look back on it, I wouldn't do it again. Um, I would definitely rely on CG for that because, I mean, in the military, they've never done four people out of a 130. They only ever had one. And um, it was probably the one of the more dangerous stunts, I think, that I've set up and, and helped create with all the team we had and stuff like that. But I'd, I'd definitely use the visual effects toolbox next time for that. Um, I just don't think it's like, like Scott said, you know, it's a, it's a living, it's a, it's a business, and we want to push the boundaries, but we want to go home in the evenings. And we all know the risk. If Like, I remember Simon Crane told me early in my career, I was, I was lucky, I come from a, a rodeo background a lot, and I'd been bent a few times. And he said, look, if you're a good stuntman and you're working a lot, sooner or later, it's going to catch up with you. It's just the odds that will happen. But I think now as we're older, it's our job to keep those odds to a very minimum if we can foresee it. So the incident curve doesn't overtake us. And I think that once we get to a point where we start to let it overtake us, then I don't think we're doing the job right. I don't think we're doing a good job for the people surrounding us. They give us that trust. You know, that's, that's just how I feel of it. And I would, like I say, I would change that tomorrow. I'd never do that stunt again. It's been done. I'd never attempt to do it again. I think it's too dangerous to put people's lives when in the manner that we did at the time, you know? Amen. I, I, I'm with you on that. Um, I know you have to get ready and go, Lee, but I want to ask you another question. Sure. Um, this question will be for Lee, Justin, and Ken, because um, look, we've all come across people who have like this distorted image of themselves when it comes to their mobility, their athletic ability, their skills. <laughs> I've seen it. I've been I, on I set. 
<laughs> it, this so, is the perfect question. Please keep going. You're going to <laughs> You know, I, I've seen it. I'm, I'm like, okay. So as a stunt coordinator, how do you convince an actor that is so gung-ho and set on doing their own stunts that it's probably not in their best interest? And that's to me, isn't it? Right, great. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. It's I love you, that Justin and Ken. <laughs> oh, well, most people that know me, I, I can be quite direct. Um, yeah. I try to be as polite as possible, but yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but normally, once you get to know me, we'll we I'll, I'll quite discreetly say, look, you're not up to that in the best possible way, or insurance. Well, the insurance won't allow you to do that. Please let your stunt double do it. Um, but it's uh, yeah. I, I think you've got to be pretty honest. I mean, I, I think of all of us guys on here, I remember being around some amazing talent uh, and, in, and seeing some guys that were doing, a, a, you know, a, a 25 metre high fall. And I'd be, I'd think, oh, you know what, I'm, I'd leave that, I'm going to leave that to those guys. Or a guy doing a knockdown, I'd crash all over the place on motorcycles or put me on a ratchet. And I'd see some guy you with know, spatial awareness do something that was just completely out of my comfort zone. And it applies for actors, really. I think, I think we all get to work with them very closely. I think we're, we all know our jobs. And it's just being realistic and, and seeing what their skill set can, um, can get them to in a the time we have to train them. That's what we're always up against, aren't we? We always get a short period of time with a lead actor or actress. They all want to do all their own stunts. Uh, and then you actually start breaking that down and seeing where you can get to before they actually have to achieve that scene. And the same thing for me, I spent a lot, I mean, I'm not known quite well for, you know, motorcycle work as well. And I condense that down to being absolutely brutal. I, as soon as I see someone touch a motorcycle, I can see where I can get them within two weeks, where I can get them in six weeks or whether I'm actually going to put them on a motorcycle at all. So uh, I think it's just being really um, open and honest and trying to get the, uh, put them in the best position so they can be comfortable and, 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 and get the best out of sequence, really. I don't know if I've answered that fully, but that's kind of <laughs> polite way of saying, assess them, and then if they're safe to do a certain amount that works for camera and we achieve the scene, then, then great. But if not, that's where the doubles come in. That's where, we're, that's where we um, earn our money. Yeah, I mean, uh, that, obviously, I think Lee hit, hit, hit it right on the head. I mean, here, at the end of the day, you know, as a coordinator, it's your job to make those decisions, whether they are qualified to do it, if they can do it, or if they should do it. And there's many factors, right? And it's, and I think that's a, a big thing we talk about now is having the confidence to stand up to say, hey, listen, I don't think you need to do this. And there's many reasons <laughs> for that, right? There are many reasons for you may be on a movie or a series and you don't need that shot, right? Maybe you don't need that shot of them or you still have six months of shooting. Yeah. So you have to kind of control their ego and make that decision, right? You know, obviously not take away their confidence because you're going to need them to do something else at a different point. But at the same time, you have to, that's your job. Your job is to step up and when it's say, hey, listen, I don't think we need this right now. You know, it's kind of like I've always related to like being like a director, right? A director is kind of like, what are they doing to actors? They're trying to convince them to do what they need them to do. Mm -hmm. right? And there's many different ways. And that's the same thing there when it comes to that, because it's all ego when it comes down to it. It's not the physical part. It's just massaging and dealing with their ego. Yeah. knowing what you need and is it worth it at that point in time got yeah, none that uh, justin or lee they nailed it so okay i'm gonna i'm gonna jump in i'm lots of love everyone i've got to go I'm, i've just said to tom i've got to give a speech my 80 my father-in-law's 80th um birthday right now so i'm more nervous about that than doing anything <laughs> <laughs> so look well, much actually, love everyone and Lee, it's so more honor for me to be, to be nominated for you guys as well yeah. so Thank You're more you. nervous Happy of Jim than Happy birthday. Oh, good to see you. Yeah. Guys, he's That's more great. nervous of his wife than he is of anything else. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all are, aren't we? <laughs> right. Much love, guys. Oh, Sorry. Thank you. Stay. Yeah. Cheers, Lee. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Um, so um, that was awesome. This question, ne this next question comes from Michael Cervantes, who's an actor. And he says, how much of your vision actually comes to fruition in the actual scene? And are there moves or that you envision that are just not possible? And then what happens at that point? 
So the, okay, the beginning part is, is meeting up with the director. This is, this is how I personally kind of go through a sequence. First of all, you assess, assess all the actors physically. We go through a little bit of training, have a meeting with the director. I go through and I say, okay, what, what exact story points are you trying to hit? Is there like some of these shows are like, we only have 56 seconds for this one section. Like sometimes you're doing a reshoot or you're doing something specific. Um, so I ask what the time is, what the specific points are, the story points and the acting points. And then I'll be like, do you have any moves or, or anything that inspires you? And she'll be like, oh my goodness, no. Like in Loki, she's like, I just need him to end up here, touch this, leave out that door. I'm like, great. So fight in the middle. And um, yeah, and so we'll go through and and we do fight viz. So where we film, I don't do elaborate fight viz on a show like Loki because it's it's a high turnaround and I wanna be able to present multiple options to see what the responses are. So we'll shoot a fight viz with, a, with the stunt doubles. Um, based on what the actor abilities are for the acting moments and maybe add a couple stunt moves in or a wreck or something like that to, to amp it up with our stunt double. And then I'll present, you know, three, four different versions, just, just like a reference version of, of action to the director, see what she responds to. And she'll say, Hey, I really like this. I really like that. That's a great moment. Don't really like that. And I'll be like, great. Then I'll go back and maybe shoot a little bit more of an elaborate stunt viz based on her responses. And then we'll take that to, to set and, uh, and try to shoot that. Um, sometimes, yeah, there's things that happen on set where you're, they're like, we don't have time for that other wire gag. And that's why for me, having done so many shows with a quick, um, with short schedules or quick turnaround, it's, I always have something in my, I always have something practical in my back pocket. You know what I mean? It's like, great. That doesn't need to be a wire gag. It can be this here. Which one do you like this or this? Great. So just fall down on the ground there or hit this thing instead. And I have a breakaway for that. So it still gives the illusion of a action beat without having to do the time of putting a wire in or, or whatever that is. So they always have like backup upon backup upon yeah. backup, backup you know, plan. For, for anything that could possibly happen. Um, and I don't get married to action. Like I, I'm, I'm, I love being creative and I'll always have stuff, you know, in, yeah. In the pocket. I don't, I'm not married to a stunt gag or a, wire gag or a certain fight move. Like I'm, you know, I want everything to be cool, hit the acting points, but if I have to adjust, that's not a problem. I don't know if that even answered the question or if no. I, <laughs> I think you did, Mo. Okay. <laughs> and, you, and you added some extra flair to it. It was yeah. good. But look, Jenny, I think everyone on the panel, I, I gotta say from my experience, looking all the people on the panel here, it is their vision majority of the time. You know, directors and producers say, you know, it's a car chase or a fight with, with Monique or whoever. Give us a version. Give us your version. Give us that. It is, this is where it comes down to. And I think that a lot of people in the industry, and I think everyone here would agree, it's not recognised a lot. And a lot of directors, and like when you're doing the second units, et cetera, and everyone on this panel is going to be, has been experiencing that or is up for it very soon, is that you're, you come in to do that action because directors don't have the ability to visualise it and get it for their project. And I think that's a lot of stunt coordinators and that all at the top of the game like Lee and Scott and, and everyone, um, you've got to have that visualisation. You've got to have that creative side to you. Otherwise, you're never going to get where you've got to be, it, it, you know, because it is creatively being able to pull the right people, be able to... You know, there's so much stuff being done over the last hundred years. It's not necessarily everything is new. You know, you, to come up with something new is very difficult. It's 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 about doing it very well and in the setting that goes with the create creative of the of the main unit director or the director. That's what you got to fit into them. So I think the question is, you know, is there a creative side? Hundred percent. Without that, we wouldn't be where we are and on the projects we've done. Any of us. I just like to agree with Monique and. I think you go into every sequence, whether it's a car chase or a fight scene or any extended stunt sequence, that you got to have safety. You got to have meaning things you can pull out. You can switch things and change to fit the time because the day never gets never goes like you're expecting it to go. You know, in a perfect day, we're going to get all of this, and you plan for a perfect day, but you never have a perfect day. Yeah. And like you know, Monique said, you always have solutions in your back pocket. And I think half of our job is 
going in with the plan, but then thinking on your feet and being able to change that plan to fit where you're at at that point. And I think now, I think it's got like such a, it's more than ever, it's more, more applicable to our industry to be able to change on the fly, to be able to give a safe stunt action, et cetera, with COVID, with changing schedules every day, et cetera. We're more jammed now than I think we've been in the last 20 years um, in that sort of situation where you need to be able to change at a moment's notice. I mean, we're all on the creative hamster wheel yeah. all day. So it's like, be safe and then get that, get that creativity going on. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Since we're talking about like creativity and we're on sets and we're, you, you're coming up with your sequences and you're having the meetings with the directors and um, how much does the set uh, interfere or aid in the fight or the sequence? I mean, they might, what if there's like a stare in the middle of, they said they want this spider. Does this, does this make sense? Like how much does the set really interfere or aid in your, in your vision that you might have? Well, I think like Tom was saying and Scott and everybody that like, that's yeah. where the creative aspect comes from, right? That's where the problem solving comes from. You still, regardless of what it is or what your obstacle is in there, you still need to put together a sequence that flows, that works, right? And one is also that's shootable, right? And I think that's a lot of the, you know, a lot that's that's lost sometimes is it's not just putting a sequence together, right? It's putting a sequence together that is shootable and is efficient and shootable. And then that's where being creative and and like I said, like Tom was saying probably don't get enough, I wouldn't say respect, but acknowledgement for that is like, you're probably not going to have a director that's going to come in and figure that out, right? Mm -hmm. You're, that's what we get paid to do. That's what we get paid to do. And probably above and beyond, because you still got to make it work, you know, and you still have to make, make it shootable and flow and whatever the obstacles may be, you know what I mean? So I think, you know, obviously sometimes you get to a situation, it doesn't work, you know, that's just what it is. And that's why you yeah. scale things. But on the, all those other instances, you just have to figure out a way to make it work and change things as it goes. A huge part of this job that we don't, I don't think people talk about very much is collaboration, like with all the other departments, mm-hmm. like you're having a meeting, like, I go straight. I'm like, oh, I'm hired. Great. I'm going to go meet with art department right now. And I'm going to go meet with the visual effects and I'm going to see, meet with construction. I'm going to see if I can, you know, get the table padded and get this. And can we cut a hole in the ceiling before you build the whole thing or something that can come out? Like, I just go, you just go and you have to collaborate with all these other departments and, and do it during the construction process. If you have that ability, if it's not obviously a, a location that's already built, if you have that ability to create a, a set with the art department that's okay for visual effects, that works for the director and 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 works for the action, then like that's that's a huge part of um, that's a huge part of the job, I think, as a stunt coordinator. And then yeah, if you're if it's on location, you're like, this is what we can do, this is what we can't do, and you back you work backwards from that. Mm-hmm. Love it. Uh, so you're all here, you're sitting down, or yeah, okay, everyone's sitting. Um, and you're nominated for these huge shows. I mean, so what's next? What do you aspire? I mean, I've heard each and every one of you talk and it sounds like everyone started off as a stunt performer. Now you're coordinating. So is there a hierarchy in the stunt world that you aspire to get to outside of this industry? Um, yeah. I would say, I, I mean, I know everyone else is probably in the grind as well. I think it's a pretty, uh, you know, it's, it's the next one, I guess. Right. It's the next one. And what are you going to do on, what are you going to do on the next one? That's kind of where we're, I know a bunch of us shoot second unit and, you know, that's, you know, I think, you know, obviously there's one step up from that. Right. And that's becoming a director. Right. But I think, you know, at least for me and the, you know, I just try to stay focused on what is next, you know, what's the next one, you know, going to be. Yeah. I mean, Justin's <laughs> the next one, but you know, ultimately, <laughs> you know, stay doing second unit directing and all that. And, you know, and then it's just, you know, 
these guys laid the foundation for the younger group like me to come in. And so it's me, you know, staying true to what these guys set up and making sure that I'm honoring that coming up through the ways. I'm only 32 years old. Right. And then, so I got my DGA on season four of Cobra Kai. I got to second to direct the rooftop jumping scene. So it's like staying true to everything that I've learned from all these guys that's on this panel. And then just making sure that, as the younger group of the generation of stunt performers and stunt coordinators and second unit directors that are coming up that, you know, we stay true to what these guys laid the foundation in the past coming through. And I think sometimes some of us as a younger generation, we forget that. And so it's my job to make sure that we are giving the stunt name, the stunt coordinators and the young DGA members, the young second unit directors like myself, making sure that we understand what Tom and Justin and Monique and Scott and Lee, what they have set forward for us and that we're lucky enough to be in the position that we are as a young group moving forward, and making those guys proud. And, and for the audience that doesn't know what second unit directing is, like what, can you just explain that really quick, what that is for someone that doesn't know? They've seen it in the credits, but they don't really know what it is. Scott, Tom. No, or, God, no. Go ahead, Scott. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> no, no, you guys. No, please. what I tell people, they're like, second unit, this, don't they, you know, it's, you know, for this panel, there's different versions of it. For this panel, it's just the action unit. You know, those that we have an experience and you know, like Monique said, you're developing a sequence and, you know, Tom, you know, at the level of those movies these guys are doing, that you're, you know, uh, like Dune, you're going to do a whole fight scene. You got to deal with all those things. And then the direct, you're going to, you know, how much of it's really going to be an actor and how much is going to be the doubles and you're going to figure those shots out. But so that's what a second unit. But to, if I can speak personally, you know, I'm, I, I, I was talking to my wife the other day and I think I may be one of the most fortunate humans on the planet because I've never considered myself overly great at anything. And I just happened to come up under and have, you know, I came up under Dan Bradley, who's just this amazing, you know, second unit director and visionary in, in our industry and has done a number of things that have just become commonplace. And then my group that I came up with was the Darren Prescott's and Chad Stahelski's, the Dave Leach, the I mean, the list is long of just these rock stars. And we were just a bunch of young kids just trying to get another day of work. Hold on a second. Hey, guys. <laughs> hey, stop working. <laughs> He's doing uh, a panel. <laughs> but uh, I, I think um, now, you know, because you look at the, you know, the Chad Stiles, he's the Dave Leach, you know, Darren's trying to direct a movie. These guys are all moving up. I don't want to direct a movie. I won, first of all, I think I'd be god awful at it. You know, JJ Perry, <laughs> like all these guys. I love second unit, but I also equally love mentoring. And I'm now at a point where, you know, what's the next thing? What's the next? I, the movie doesn't, is sort of inconsequential. I like telling a story. I like doing what we do, creating things. But I get, I'm actually at a point in my life, and, you know, all this gray hair should tell you how old I am. It's pretty damn old. <laughs> but I'm not physically, I'm like, I've got nothing. I, I don't have it anymore. I'm, I like to be fit, but I'm a fit old man, not a, you know, but I can help a whole nother generation. And in this generation, I can help people of color. I can help women, you know, and, and I, I, I think it's a really exciting time because I think a young stunt woman can be coming up and looking at, oh, I can do that. You know, they can look at Monique and go, well, well, she's doing it, so I can do it. Like, Monique didn't have that. I mean, Debbie Evans is a very dear, close friend of mine. And you know, I, it's been best described as, you know, Debbie's probably one of the top five stuntmen that's ever been in business. You know, mm -hmm. She's a beast. But at no point was the industry ever going to let her do that. I don't know if she did want it to or didn't want to. You know, it's like, but... I think now is an opportunity for those of us that um, have been very fortunate to, you know, in our line of work, diversity can't, you can't snap a finger and diversity happens because the, the consequences are too high. But 
I think if we all reach out and look for those people, you know, I, I had met Guy Fernandez a number of years ago in New Orleans and Guy Fernandez is now running Star Trek, you know, and I helped him get there. And I, I purposely was, saw something in him as we spoke earlier that he had his eyes wide open and he was really interested. And so I, I was like, Hey man, why don't you come along on this journey? I can't promise you anything, but an opportunity opened up and it was great. You know, and I, and I think those of us like Tom and, and you know, mm-hmm. us older fellows that have had this great experience and a great opportunity need to, you know, reach down and work on getting that diversity because, you know, let's be honest, if you're a DP or an actor, or almost any other uh, craft, if you have a bad day, it just didn't look great or it didn't go well. If we have a bad day, we're, we're visiting uh, our friends in the hospital. So we don't want, none of us want to do that. So I think it's really important to work on diversity because it's still a number of years out. You know, Monique's had the opportunity and she was a, you know, highly respected stunt woman that mm-hmm. has worked her way to this position. No, I, I totally that's agree. What, that's what my going forward mm-hmm. is from. Yeah, I agree, Scott, because I've been doing stunts just over 11 years, only been coordinated by three females and Mel's one of them. And she's on the panel. The other yeah. two are out of frame. You know yeah. what I mean? Can I say something to what Scott was saying? Scott, you know, uh, you know a girl named uh, Marielle Woods, correct? Mm-hmm. He, he directed four episodes with me, season four and five. Oh, that's on, great. Uh, yeah. He was my director who she came under Scott. So every day on set, <laughs> she's telling great stories of Scott. So Scott's not just saying that. He is truly, <laughs> truly doing it to where Mariel Woods got to direct four episodes of season four and five to Cobra Kai and she did a fantastic job and she knew a lot from Scott. So when she came over, I didn't have to hold her hand or anything like that. She crushed it because of the mentorship that she got from Scott and from guys like Casey. Yeah. 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 Proof is in the pudding. That's it. Yeah. Live it. That's great. So we have like, Two questions left. The last one's a really, really fun one, I think. Uh, but Miranda Donato, who's a producer, she asks you guys, what's your dream project? Like if there could be one movie or TV show that you could really show off all of your skills, coordinating, stunts, whatever it might be, what would that, pro- what would that project be or look like? Mo, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> um. <clears throat> Yeah. Okay. We'll piggyback from that last one. The last, the last thing. So <laughs> I, I just, honestly, I just love action comedy. Like, so I, I, I can't remember the, what the name of it is, but this new Nicolas Cage movie, the trailer that I saw, I was, I was just laughing my ass off. because I'm like, that is like totally a movie I want to make. Um, so I, I want to direct eventually. And I want to direct action comedy. I do not have any interest in directing something serious and like whatever. I want it to be fun. I want it to be a little raunchy. I want there to be like a ton of wacky action. And it just be one of those movies that that like you want to watch over and over again, you know. So one day that will happen. There's there's some there's some writing that's going on, but um, yeah, for now it's like I'm a baby second unit director. Loki was my first second unit um my my dga on loki so i've my heart, I love this show for that and so i'm you know i'm still like working on learning more with second unit directing and and while simultaneously you know working on writing and and um thinking about you know directing main unit at some point awesome mm-hmm. you gonna get it mo yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay tom i said you could go second oh i don't know um for me I think probably one of the favorite movies out of all the movies I've done was Blood Diamond. Paul Jennings was a coordinator. I was a floor supervisor on it. I think um, I'd like to do in my career one more movie in that vein and being the boss and the stunts and second unit. I, d- I just loved everything about it that we did, the locations and, um, you know, the people I knew and met and friends and that. And that was probably one of the best experiences I think, uh, you know, I've had on any film set anywhere in the world. And I, I think all the experiences we get to have are incredible. But if I could do something again um, on a, a purely um, 
you know, new script and and um, an original. Um, I'd like to do something like that. Love it. I love Blood Diamond, by the yeah. way. Amazing. Yeah, it was um, an amazing project to work on. Yes. I have it on DVD. <laughs> okay, Justin, Ken, Scott, same question. Uh, I, I would just love to do, and I just, just because over the, the Christmas break, I was watching uh, a, a bunch of, 80s 90s movies with my son the diehards and the you know the, the rocky fours and all those things i mean I, I would love to do you know just one of those throwback 80s 90s you know action movie i mean i think those things were so great i mean that's what i grew up on i think it would be a, you know an awesome thing to do i mean i think the closest thing i ever got to it was working on the first expendables movie which was you know just I don't know. There's something about that. I think that would bring you back to your childhood with just fun, ridiculous, over the top kind of, but grounded action. I think to me, that would be something would be cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I just, I just wanted, you know, I love like story. I love story driven action. I love having a purpose for doing what we're doing. I always try to find like, you know, what's the nuances to this, where can I, you know, what can I pull from, from other things? So mine would just be, you know, obviously I would love to do the big giant crazy action movies like these guys do, but you know, it's almost, it's almost for me more of a challenge to not just throw a kick, not just throw a punch, but have a purpose behind it for the story. And, you know, even if I set it up in episode one, you know, or hour one of the movie that the reason why I did this is because of this later on in, in the series or the film. And I just, that's what really drives me. And again, still learning the ropes from, you know, people like this in this panel from second unity and like watch, that's the thing as I have a football background. So we watched film before we played football. So watching movies and TVs that, TV shows that these guys have done, that's me watching film to further my craft. And so I love doing that. So like when I'm watching all these shows and, you know, watching Dune and seeing the opening sequence of this huge, crazy concept of these guys in crazy futuristic armor, and then you see these other dudes popping out of the sand in slow motion and stabbing them, you're like, well, that's amazing. So you're like studying all these little moments and then you're trying to say, well, how can I use that type of shot, that type of reveal in something else? Not just that, but how do you, it's just studying, it's just learning. It's not copying, it's like paying homage. It's, you know, like I was saying before, these guys have laid the groundwork. It's like, just do your study. Like Justin was saying, he was watching all the diehards. That's classics. You can yeah. learn so much from those movies without CGI because you can see how they did it practical and then vice versa. Look at all these, you know, the Avengers and all that stuff, seeing how they're CGI and practical marrying the two. It's like, there's a wealth of knowledge out there. It's fun to study it, uh -huh. but don't just totally, it's good to watch it mindlessly sometimes. But when I watch stuff, it gets annoying because I'm sitting there watching it and studying it. And everyone that I'm watching movies with, they're like, you're like really looking at it. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm studying. Leave me alone. I'm a nerd, but you know, I love it. It's yeah. It's, I nerded it's, out on the behind the scenes of John Wick with the yeah. motorcycle. So Scott yeah. that, and the horse, that was awesome. Yeah. I have to say, I was just like, Oh, that's a great use of, of the effects. And yeah, I mean, you got it. Action. That was awesome. Yeah. you you explain it. I mean, so eloquently about the doing the research and studying, I call it being a student of the sport. You know, when I started, I, I, would go up to coordinators and be like, you coordinated this show, this show, and you did that. Like you just study and you do all your research. So I, I was loving everything you were saying about that. I, I as much enjoy the smaller movies as like the bigger movies. Now, now at this point, I don't have a big stunt. Like every big stunt has a cost and it has, a, you know, it, um, I mean, it takes a lot out of you. Like at least like uh, Tom said, he wouldn't, do that, the jump out the back of that C-17 again. You know, that comes at a cost and I'm not willing to pay those prices that much all the time. And as much as I enjoy doing big movies, you know, we were, I was fortunate to do Keanu Reeves' last three movies. 
And on the last one, we were sitting there and he goes, I like big movies. I like seeing big movies. I like working on big movies. And I was like, and I was like, I do too, but you know, <laughs> and it's fun and I like big movies, but I like small movies. So now for me and going back to what we are talking about mentoring and all of that and bringing people up, I enjoy the team effort. I was a team sports player um, in college and all of that. And now for me, it's developing a team. And I've, like you know justin before we came on he was talking about trying to be home with his family and this and that and i did that and my kids have not grown so now i'm traveling the world and sort of developing teams in these different places and yeah. and i'm i'm really enjoying that part of it as much as the film itself so that's sort of where i'm that's my dream love it so final questions um so everyone basically get the same question, but it's altered a little bit because some of you are nominated TV coordinators and some are nominated movie coordinators. So for my TV coordinators, this question is for you. Outstanding action performance by a stunt ensemble and a motion picture nominees are Black Widow, Dune, Matrix Resurrection, No Time to Die, and Shang-Chi and the Legend of the Ten Rings. Who wins? Mo, you go first. What's your answer? Uh, that's a rough one, man. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, this and this, everyone's gonna understand why this is my answer. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, oh my goodness. I'm supposed to say who I think is gonna win? Exactly, yes. <sighs> that, this okay, is well, I have to <laughs> who say Who do you think that... gonna win or who does she want to win? <laughs> yeah, which one of those? Well, yeah. you, you, we okay. want an answer. <laughs> okay, fine. I think Shang-Chi. And that is because I thought the action was amazing. I thought the fights were unique. Um, I love Brad and rest in peace. And I've, you know, had an opportunity to, to see, like I was, I went over for a meeting for Wonder Woman in the first Wonder Woman when he was a part of it. And I just, I got to be in his world. There was candles and it was just this peaceful place and his creativity and his, just the way he spoke about action and about the show, like incredibly inspiring. And I feel like that came out in Shang-Chi and I just thought it was such a fun movie and it had so much Brad in it. And that is why, what I say for that. Right. And I love everybody else's. I've enjoyed all the movies. I really have. I just, I, I, yeah, you I know, agree. we get the disclaimers. Yeah. You know. <laughs> I'm Canadian. I have to do a disclaimer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, Justin, your answer. Honestly, I don't have even a good answer because I'll tell you why. I haven't seen any of the movies and I haven't seen any of the TV shows, including Mayor of Easttown. <laughs> and I'm not and I'm not even making I'm not even making that up. Um, so I mean, how, many kids, how many kids do you have? Justin? I got two, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I kind of, I don't know. I just, that's just, I'm not a big TV movie watcher. I mean, I do, I'll go through and I'll watch things, but like to sit down and watch, say I watched the movie for three hours, unless I'm on a plane somewhere, like it just, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't happen. You know, so unfortunately, I don't, I, I can't pick anybody. I hope they all win. How about that? Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to, I'm going to piggyback off a moment and change you. No, because, no, oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. You said you're going to piggy, piggyback on Justin and not give an answer? No, no, no. no, no. Back off and say oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, okay. No, no respect that for Brad and everything. Rest in peace. He, you know, in Shang Chi his storytelling in his fights came out and it's like, you know, as martial artists being around martial arts for a year, everyone that came out as we were shooting and we were just in all watching. We all went to see it as a team. We all got to watch it. Like his storytelling came out in the fights and that's very hard to do at that level. And he, I mean, it's just amazing. So no disrespect to anybody else. Now, Scott and Tom. So this question is for you too. Outstanding action performance by a stunt ensemble and a television series nominees are Cobra Kai, The Falcon and the Winter Soldier, Low Key, Mayor of Easttown, and Squid Game. Who wins? Tom, go first. 
really hard one. I think the thing is when you have a panel of the people that are before you, everyone is so bloody talented, honestly, and what they put together. I mean, I, I did. I like Loki. Um, I like Cobra Kai very much. I don't think that there's one that I could choose between out of all of them. Um, Squid Games is not necessarily my cup of tea, but it's done really well and people love it, you know. So, and this is the thing, as I say to a lot of people when they're being critics and or critical of something, we all can be critics. But when, if you take it and look look at a project in the genre it is or the age group, I think every 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 project has something to offer. And I think that, you know, everyone, we're very lucky to be um, in our business and nominated. And I honestly couldn't choose one that I think is going to win out of the whole category. That's the truth. And I think everyone's done a fantastic job. And I think it's just, yeah, it's amazing to see what's coming out in, the, in this, this year now and hopefully next year, you know? Scott, I know you have an answer. <laughs> 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 Come on, Scott. Just want, I just want to go down. on record as saying Dune is the best movie I've seen in <laughs> two years. It's so, amazing. Tom, thank you. Yeah. That was I. That was I walked out of the theater in Glasgow going, "Oh, that's what seeing a good movie is like." Oh. I really, I really enjoyed it. But uh, to be honest, um, I, I I agree with Tom. Um, about the talent and I think there there's no bad choice, but I did like Loki. I liked the quirkiness of it and just, it was, and I, you know, I appreciated how Monique, you know, stitched did, you know, it's just a weird world and you it's you know, being in those when the timelines and the, all that stuff is happening you, to keep it all together is a difficult. And then, you know, in that situation, I, so I, I liked them all, but I like Loki. Awesome. Well, I thank each and every one of you for being a part of this panel. Um, do you have any last words before I give my close? Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> listen, listen, I, I'm, I'm going to have one last word before I go. Listen, I normally swerve these kind of things like the plague, but Everyone that's on the panel, I really love all their work and, and you know, Ginter and Brad and everyone else, bless them, you know, who are not here. So, and I just thought, hell, I'd like to be part of it. And it was just really good to see all the work that people are trying, trying to, to achieve in the situation that we have these last couple of years. And it's really great. And um, that's what made me be part of it. And well done, everyone. All I can say to, to everyone out there, you know, you've all done a fantastic job. Because I love to watch everything, you know, whatever it, whatever it might be, you know. Thank you. You're not like Justin. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. I did, I, if you, you do enough TV, you don't want to watch TV anymore. <laughs> you watch uh, TV well, all day Justin, long. Justin and Scott are going to laugh about this. And when he, I started again, I've got a one-year-old, so I ain't getting oh my God. any speed <laughs> Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, Yeah. So, and when I knew you would laugh because I know you nobody really knows about it. Um, I, I, don't, I, I don't really um, do social media. And so no one really knows about it, but I know that you did you it. Know. I was dying to tell you. I'm about to yeah. tweet it out. Yeah. Now we know um, why you're in Europe. Um, and I feel like so much more intelligent than that. <laughs> you know what, actually, I got to say, it, it's an incredible experience again, and um, it, it lets me watch a lot of everyone's work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I love this panel. I honestly, I was so excited to see all you guys because I feel like once we all start coordinating, I don't see anybody anymore. And I don't like no. Tom, we haven't seen each other in so long. Like, like, I was Ken, I haven't seen you in forever. I just, you know, I'm so grateful to hear you guys and see where everybody's at. and see what sort of some ideas for the future. And I think that um, this, yeah, I think this is going to be a really cool um, panel for people to listen to. And it's, yeah, it's, I'm very excited to be a part of it. And yeah, good, great to see you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yes. Um, well, on behalf of the SAG After Foundation, I want to thank you for sharing your experiences, process and craft with your fellow performers. Thank you. Well, there we go. That is uh, that's that, and I, I say, you know, a very entertaining watch. Uh, it's very interesting to see how they all got their start in their careers and uh, the beauty of uh, of Zoom 
let's be fair, um, that uh, that wouldn't have happened a long time ago, and yet because of uh, the situation that the world has been plunged into, everybody does Zoom, um, even if Lee Morrison had to leave uh, in the middle there because he was attending uh, a party. Uh, so you know the whole uh, the whole thing is is uh, is nicely captured. I enjoyed that. I hope you did too. And uh, that's about the size of it as far as programmes dedicated to awards is considered. Obviously, when the Oscars comes along, we'll probably have a little look at the results of that and see what the deal was. Uh, but um, obviously, because there's there's no uh, award for the stunt professionals. We may not be looking into it closely enough, but we can only hope that based on our recent episodes, maybe something is going to get done. And uh, we'll see how we get on. Next week, we will be back to the good old format of looking at movies. If you've missed it over the last couple of weeks, I'm sorry, but these are important times and we need to get them done. So next week, we will be back looking at film, exploring some of the action sequences uh, in more detail. And we're going to start next week with a movie that has been rather hotly requested all over my DMs, private messages emails, you name it, I've received it. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, I'm going to let you sweat out a bit longer. But safe to say, there ain't nothing like the life of a Hollywood stuntman. Until next week, bye for now.